Krosta. Andrea Krosta is maybe the last hope for the African elephant. With a hidden camera and a lot of courage, he investigated the big business uh, with ivory. And I don't know with whom I can share it. The von ihm gegründete whistleblowing platform. The whistleblowing platform Wild Leaks wants to fight against poachers and other environmental crimes. Bye bye. Dank seiner undercover Arbeit. Thanks to his undercover work, some of the most brutal poachers have been arrested. Neon Green Network welcomes Andrea Krosta. I need the, the clip. Oh. Yeah. He has it. Oh, he's there. Okay. Done. So good afternoon. Back and forth. That's fine. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a, it's a gigantic room full of people. It's a great honor. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful and, uh, and, you know, to the organizer for inviting me. I'm, not just because I can share with you pieces of my Work and life, now they merge together, there's no more difference between one another. But also I can talk about a very important issue, which is wildlife crime. And you might not be so familiar with, uh, with the concept of wildlife crime, and what is wildlife crime, and what it's doing to all of us. And uh, we are not talking only about wildlife crime, I'll, 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 I'll talk about an intelligence-led approach to wildlife crime, which is what we are doing in, with our organization. So, uh, how uh, we merged the world of conservation and wildlife protection, that you probably all know about it, with the world of professional intelligence and investigations and technology. Use this uh, set of skills to protect wildlife um, and the environment. Uh, before that, there are, um, the organizer asked me to add a few biographical elements to the story because, you know, it took, took a long circle for me to get here. And, uh, and maybe someone has similar, uh, inform similar stories. So I was born uh, there, uh, two hours more or less from Milano in Italy. I cannot imagine a place more far away from wilderness and nature and, and, and wild animals. And, uh, and, when I, and unfortunately or fortunately, I was born with this huge passion for animals and for wildlife with desire to protect them. Since I was really a kid, like five, six years old. Uh, my only link to nature was actually the dog of my grandmother. That's the only animal I had around me. And, you know, it's a time, you know, I was a, a city boy and then a teenager in the, in the 70s and in the 80s. No internet, no Facebook, lousy TV, super expensive international flights. So I kind of stuck there with my dreams. And I had a very, very specific dream. And please don't laugh about the next slide. I wanted to become like her. That's my, my dream was to be a park ranger in a national park in Canada or the US. That was my dream. Very, very precise. So taking care, protecting bears and wolves and deers and mooses and forests and maybe some tourists. And, uh, and, uh, but mostly animals. Um, and I got stuck with this dream for a long time. I mean, I was un until I was uh, middle high school, so you can imagine the jokes. They call me grizzly bear, they call me teddy bear, that this is the nice things they call me. So, but, you know, I, that's what I wanted to do. And I got stuck with that uh, for a long time until when I turned 17, one of the many turning points, my father allowed me to go to South America to join uh, an expedition to the Amazon, to Venezuela, to, to reach a beautiful place. It's called Salto Angel. I don't know if it's, what, it's, a, it's the highest waterfall in the world. It's almost 1,000 meters of water. I don't know how I got, I mean, my, I, I think my parents were divorced, so they, uh, they, were, they felt guilty, and I leveraged on that, and they allowed me to go because it was crazy. I'm 17 years old, you can imagine. So it's, uh, but I, I got there, and it was an unbelievable experience, you know, for a, such a young age to, I don't know if any of you ever went to, a, to the jungle, any jungle. It's a, it's a super, super powerful place, and to, to be able to touch those trees and to hear... I mean, changed my life. And I kind of dropped the park ranger dream. I said, okay, maybe it's not gonna happen. 
but, uh, but I want to be part of all this. I want to study this. I want to be involved with this. I didn't really know how. But I, I started from a scientific point of view. So fast forward a few years, I went to the university. Uh, I, I studied natural science at the University of Milano with a thesis on European author. Then I started working on a, a well-known uh, foundation, small foundation in Italy, sp specializing in conservation and uh, endangered species as a breeding center. And I was there for a few years. Then, then you know, life happened, and uh, um, many things changed. I lost my mother when I was young. I was just 24, and I had other problems, so I need to kind of make a living, and I didn't get much money from con the conservation work. So I continued to work in pro bono, and I shifted completely, and I went into business. And uh, with a natural science uh, degree, so kind of surrounded by people telling me I was crazy. And, uh, and out of the blue, I established the very first, one of the very first e-commerce company, companies in Italy for, for shopping online, selling the best of Italy to the rest of uh, the world. Um, it was the prehistory of internet. It was 98, like Google was founded in, in 98. Three years, a lot of success, uh, a lot of media attention, money from, donor, from investors, and uh, the first case history of Microsoft uh, for e-commerce in Italy, then life. Happened again, and this time, Nasdaq crashed. Uh, and the company lost. I lost everything almost overnight. Investors disappeared. I sold, uh, I sold it for the debt, so I made zero. And, uh, but that was a very instructing experience. You know, you can imagine doing everything, including technology, was like making, I don't know, doing a two PhDs in three years on debt. And this technology led me to other kind of technologies, security-related technologies, and security-related technologies that took me to security services. And to make a long story short, for over 15 years, 16 years, I had a very unique job. I was, in, I was working as a private consultant in between governments and security vendors and large corporations, and some of you would say, oh, he was working for the devil. I was not working for the devil. I was right in the middle of many <laughs> devils. I was just do my best to remain clean. And I did everything. I did uh, crypto, uh, encryption, and security of uh, important uh, critical sites, uh, working with the government, uh, uh, anti-piracy off the coast of Somalia during the anti-piracy years. We're working with technologies for law enforcement, and I, I mean, after 15 years, I kind of thought, okay, that's my, probably that's my life. I was very, very unhappy. Uh, something was very big was missing. I didn't understand exactly what. And then five years ago, what, another turning point, probably the most important so far, um, I was in Kenya for a security assignment, working with a for a client, and, uh, and one day I wanted to go to the bush, I wanted to see some elephants, I, I knew the rangers, so I said, okay, let's, can I come with you, see how you work? I, I, we got, you know, rumors of a poaching incident, I just wanted to, to see. I apologize in advance for the next slide. I will keep it only for a few seconds, because it's the only horrible slide of my presentation, but you have to see what I saw, because that changed my life. Okay, he was slaughtered with a calf, also small. Uh, I hope they did this when he was completely deaf. And, uh, and I, will, uh, I will just change it immediately because I know it's, it's, not, good. it's, it's not a nice view. This is a, what is left of elephants from northern Mozambique in the Kirimba National Park, 5,000 elephants gone in probably in five years. And there's a guy building something. So I was, you, I mean, it was a cathartic moment for me. I was in front of this elephant and you have to understand the situation, the, the heat, the noise, the, the, the smell, and the faces of the rangers. Is, uh, and, and, but what happened in that moment is that a seconds before, I had in front of me all these many, many pieces of the puzzle of my life completely all over the places, and I could not see the picture. I saw all these pieces, but no picture. And after this event, I saw the picture. I said, okay, now I know exactly what I want to do. I, drop this, just leave this my job, and I want to try to protect them, try to fight back for them. Because you learn why, you know, this is why they killed them. This is a picture we took in Beijing uh, uh, a year and a half ago. This piece is probably $300,000, or this in Hong Kong. Um, 
so it's, I said, okay, let's, I drop everything and I want to create something new. Not join an existing organization, make my own organization and, and make it, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to, that, that I thought I, I want to hurt some bad people now. So it's time for us to hurt bad people. No hate, just anger. <laughs> no, really. No, believe me, that just, just, just anger, because it's, you know, it's a, for Africa is a very complicated situation. We all hate poachers, but then poachers are just poor people who want to make a living, and, you know, the temptation is, it's a very complicated story. So I had, you know, conservation and wildlife protection many, many years there, but also I had, I had many, many years in, in, in these other sectors, intelligence, investigation with a lot of, can you imagine the people I met, the, the, the knowledge I have, and so I said, okay, you know what, I merged the two. And, and I created the Elephant Action League in the United States with a very specific, it's very specific what we do. We, you know, we investigate, we collect uh, information, we produce intelligence, we investigate, and then we try to fight back, you know, to move from research to, to action. Um, just a very quick snapshot of the Elephant Action League was we are a very young organization, just four years, uh, four years old. Uh, established in California. We don't have, of course, offices or staff in target countries. It would become, it would be too, too dangerous. So we have a lot of people working for us in the field in some countries, but nobody knows who they are. So we don't have, otherwise they will become a liability immediately and dangerous for them. The mission is very clear. We protect nature through investigative and intelligence efforts. Uh, and of course, the team background is very variegated, of course, conservation, but also intelligence, security, law enforcement. My two main collaborators at the moment are both very successful former FBI special agents. One of the two, a very, very, very successful undercover operative for 30 years who, that I kind of recruit them and, and, you know, and convince them to work for the environment instead of whatever they did before. We have one, <laughs> we have one guiding principle that I developed through the years, probably working with many clients. Every time I do something, I'm in the bush, I mean, I talk with the journalists, I'm here right now today, I'm asking myself, am I doing it in the interest of my clients? And you see a few pictures of my clients here. Am I doing it in, the, in their interest? Because it's you ha I have to report back to them before I report back to my board, before the donors, before the reporters, it's them. You can even mentally report into them every time you are. I, I, sometimes I do it. I'm not crazy. In the bush, the first animal I got, okay, I report to you on behalf of everyone else. What did I do for real? Not, you know, not for my ego or for, uh, or for, other, or for other reasons. So what is wildlife crime? A very quick uh, example of, in this case, is the rhino horn supply chain, but we can do it in, with many other Examples, of course, there is a ground zero. The animal is poached, is killed, or, or captured if it's a live trade. This is a, a horn of a rhino that we picture two weeks ago in South Africa. Then, there, then the horn changes a few hands, and he has to leave, the, in this case, the continent. So it goes through exit points. Uh, it gets the value, is, 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 of course, is growing. So this is the port of Mombasa. We did a little operation two years ago. Then we go to transit countries, very, very important, okay, where, where the main brokers are and when you have to hit. That was the big mistake of the past probably 40 years, just focus on the little poachers. This guy is a very, very big trafficker in Vietnam. We have been investigating him for more than a year. We also gave information to the government. I think in, in, in just one year, we saw dozens and dozens of horns going through him. And, 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 and if the whole network around is probably 500 horns. If you think about it, the South Africa loses 1,200 rhinos every year. Imagine the power that these people have. Um, and then you have the final market, the destination. This is a picture taken a week ago uh, in China, in southern China, and the red arrow is pointing to the little piece of rhino horn that is left. Uh, for different reasons, of course. There's no time now to go into why they do it, but you know, they start with traditional medicine, now it's more wealth status symbols, so pendants and, and bracelets and statue and, and cups and stuff like that. A horn like this, it's, I mean, it's, the price is now between thirty and $60,000 per kilo raw, so you can imagine how much money you, you do. It's a very, very profitable industry. It's the fourth uh, 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 criminal enterprise in the world, according to uh, UNEP and Interpol. Uh, so we're talking about, as you can see, big, big bucks. You know, it's like uh, between 100 and 260 billion dollars 
per year. But let's see what he did. You know, in the past 100 years, elephants went to five millions, from five millions to 350,000. And, and in the past four or five years, 35,000 elephants kill every year. And every single elephant of these 35,000, it's a crime. It's a crime to kill it. It's a crime to take the ivory. It's a crime to smuggle the ivory. It's a crime all the way to China to sell the ivory. Rhino, 100 years ago were half a million. Now it's 29,000. In the whole Africa, only 25,000 rhinos left. The rest is in Asia. Ridiculous what happened to tigers. There were 100,000 tigers in the wild 100 years ago. Now 3,890. We almost know them by name. And th there are more tigers in captivity in Texas than in the whole Asia in the wild. Think about how stupid is that. Illegal trade, also part of wildlife crime. 22,000 apes, mostly chimpanzees, but also orangutans disappear in the trade in the past 12 years. And of course, every time you take a baby chimp, the minimum you do is to kill all the family. You cannot just get a baby chimp and go home. You know, it's more complicated than that. Illegal logging also. Almost probably around half of the whole logging around the world is illegal. So what we do? The base is intelligence. We are an intelligence-based organization. We do intelligence work. So what is intelligence work? We work in certain countries in the shadow, we build permanent networks of sources, informants, and then there is a handler, and then there is a lead investigator, and then there is us, and we harvest, collect information continuously through years, and, and we, we, you know, we recruit new people, we collect material, documentation, picture, undercover videos, we understand who does what, and this is the base for everything. It's the foreknowledge to be uh, preemptive instead of all the time reactive. Then there is field investigation, which is different from, invest from intelligence. Intelligence is a permanent work. While investigation are target, we need uh, you know, this time, this budget, we have these objectives. Uh, this is uh, DRC Congo. And then, of course, all the time we look for evidence. That's what we are, you know, we need fact and we record it because at the end of the day we need that. Because we have to confront government, not with rumors or whatever I heard, noise, it, facts. And then there is a very important part of sharing. And there are different kind of sharing. This is an operation we uh, actually trigger in Thailand uh, uh, around two months ago. This is the Thai Royal Police. And, and because of our investigation, they I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, they arrested a, a significant wildlife trafficker and uh, confiscated a lot of it. They raided a, a facility, a big facility outside Bangkok. Another way we work is we, pr we prepare what we call confidential intel briefs. So, Confidential reports, only for law enforcement. We put inside information that we don't put in the public report, like names and telephone numbers and, and license plates and everything we know. And we give it to the law enforcement, to the right person, most hopefully, not, not the corrupt one. And we, you know, hey, that's the work, free of charge. Do something, you know, start your own investigation. And of course, whenever we can, we go public. This is the cover of one of our uh, of, of one of our um, report, Blending Ivory, is, on, is online. We, then we go, first they invite us, we go to TV and we, and we talk about it. Two examples of our work, Operation Game Over, uh, China and Hong Kong, 10 months of undercover investigation, China and Hong Kong, in and out, in and out with our teams. Uh, on the, on the, the, the focus was the, where legal and illegal overlap and where the legal system in China allows the laundering of enormous quantities of illegal ivory into the system. Uh, on, the, on one side, there's the port of Hong Kong, just to give you an idea of the size. On the other side, the illegal ivory of South Beijing. The second is the, is the operation I just uh, mentioned, Operation Australia in Thailand. Uh, we started to investigate this person more than a year ago. The reason is was because he was smuggling baby orangutans from Indonesia into Thailand and then onward. Uh, was, he was selling orangutans in Bangkok for $4,000. Per, per baby, and then we lost them. Then we were following four orangutans. Three of that, three of them died for over sedation because every time they moved them, they sedate them. The fourth one was sold. We lost the trace. We got it back, and then we finally busted him um, a month and two months ago for birds. Doesn't matter as long as we bust him. It doesn't really matter for what. Now is in out of bail, but collaborating with local police. Uh, this is the two of the little orangutan smuggled by this person. 
Um, finally, another way we try to be innovative is always try to find, okay, what we can do new. So three years ago, we launched Wide Leaks, which is the very first uh, whistleblower uh, initiative for wildlife crime, and came from the realization, my realization, I was in the field, I was in the field many times, and th there's a lot of people who knows a lot of information they don't share, for various reasons, mostly because they're afraid. So say, okay, let's build a website, start with a website, build on Tor, the Tor technology, which, you know, so anonymously and securely you can share information with us, video, documents, whatever you want, and then we, we do our best to, to, to work on it. So it's, a not, it's not just a website, it's a very proactive initiative. They send us information through the website, through Facebook, through Twitter, sometimes even in person. It goes to assessment, validation, action, and then we try to use this information the, the best way we can. Uh, we give it to law enforcement, we investigate ourselves, uh, we go to the media. And this is a snapshot of the first three years. We're going to publish a report in a couple of months of the first three years, but about 120 submissions in three years, 25 more or less useful. And as you can see, we get you know, deforestation in Mexico, Sumatra, tiger poaching in Sumatra, of course, uh, illegal live trade, documents from the custom in Hong Kong, all, all possible things. So it's not easy to as you can imagine, evaluate everything. And this is the last chapter of uh, the Wild Leaks project. We just signed a collaboration with the National Whistleblower Center in Washington, D.C. It's basically a law firm specializing in whistleblowers. They start something now on uh, wildlife crime. And what we are leveraging is there are many laws in the United States that have, the, as a provision, they, they can give a lot of money to people with information, to whistleblowers. And, and we act in the middle we, as a buffer, so the whistleblower in, whatever, in Tanzania or Thailand or Vietnam can stay anonymous. Nobody knows about him. We represent him in front of the lawyers and the U.S. government, and if the information is good, he gets a lot of money. Just to give you an idea, last year, the government of the United States gave half a billion dollars to whistleblowers. Not a cent to wildlife crime, but the potential is huge. So in order to get the big fishes, not the small fishes, the big fishes, you know, corrupt government official and blah, blah, you need uh, to give something. Uh, this is, I, I, I just go very quickly through these uh, um, slides because they are for tomorrow for the workshop. So the only chance you have to see them is to come tomorrow for the workshop. Otherwise, you'll never, ever <laughs> see them. Okay. And this is the last uh, slide. Um, how to join the fight. So unfortunately, we don't have volunteers in the field, as you can imagine. We, it's pretty complex also for, already for professionals. We work only with, with investigators or former law enforcement and anyway, people experience in, also in, in working in very difficult environment. But social network, social media it, are very important. Uh, you can do a lot there. You cannot just talk about uh, wildlife crime, which is impossible, which is uh, sorry, which is very uh, important and not enough discussed. You can talk about organizations like ours. You can even become our own, our online fighters. Go. There is so much wildlife crime happening online on Facebook and other platforms. They're selling all kind of stuff. We get stuff. So go out and look for you know. And I call us, of course, if you need any consultation. But there's a lot you can do yourself out there. When you travel, of course, uh, not just keep your eyes and ears open. We most, more than once we receive information from tourists, but also be careful of what you do and what you buy. Bef you know, buying a, a, a bracelet or, or, or a little statue behind can be, could be wildlife crime. So be careful about that. This is a, 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 a phrase from the very famous photographer Ansel Adams, why you know, we have to fight our own government to protect the environment. It's true, it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, there, there are ways to work with governments, but you always have to keep them accountable for what they don't do, and especially for the lack of willpower, political will. Without political will, you don't achieve anything. And finally, of course, donate. You know, it's, we don't get money from governments, only from private people and foundations. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, the operation, as you can imagine, are, are, are expensive. Uh, before leaving you, I would like to leave you with, uh, with a thought. Since that accident with the, with the elephant, since I saw that, I have three things in me. Uh, I have love, I have anger, not hate, anger, and I have determination. 
So I encourage all of you to look inside yourself for those three things. I, in my opinion, you need them together. You cannot do much with one or two of them. You need love, anger, and determination. And then, and then let's go out and kick some asses. So if you need in kicking ass, help in kicking asses, just, just call us. Thank you. People are appreciating what you're doing. I hope so, yeah. um, Andrea, um, th the way you just described your work, you're really um, going up against people here who are willing to go over dead bodies. <coughs> so it's really dangerous what you're doing. Yes, it is. It, it's more dangerous for the people working with me and for me, uh, to be honest. I, I try to be in the field with them every sort of two months or so, because it's important for me to see. But they are the ones who pretend to be traders, who pretend to be buyers or businessmen and engage those people and, and maybe enter very critical meetings with uh, undercover cameras. So they are the real, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the real deal here. And without them, we could not do much. Uh, we have amazing teams of, uh, we have four or five Chinese, uh, young Chinese guys, amazing. They're doing a great job for us. Chinese, young Chinese are an amazing opportunity to change this world. Like if you, they just need guidance and, and be tutored. Yeah. Uh, we have people from Taiwan, from Africa, so we, it's a good, good, good team. Have you actually met, you said, just said, you don't hate people who, for instance, kill elephants for money because the situation is more complicated than that. Have you ever met people who, out of a lack of money or other yeah, opportunities? Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, what you can expect, I mean, they, they offer you one, two, three years of salary and you have a family of 10 people maybe at home to kill an elephant, which, yeah. by the way, for them is not like for us. We see a beautiful, exotic animal. They see at best, a pest that can enter your crop and destroy your crop forever and you lose all the money for that year. So mm -hmm. how can you hate these people? They live, you know, they don't know what, you know, and I, I, if I will start offering uh, three years of salary to kill uh, an endangered animal here in Vienna, I will have a line, I think, yeah. of people. It's Even here, yeah, I it's believe It's temptation, so too, yeah. and mm -hmm. when you are, and again, exploitation of poverty is a very complicated uh, issue. It's not that simple to, mm. to debate, but... We got this one question over Twitter that says, why has the EU not supported a complete Annex 1 listing of the African elephants at CITES, C-I-T-E-S, uh, CITES, until yeah. today? Yeah. Do you feel that the EU feels like this is a problem far, far away, doesn't concern us at all? Yeah, I mean... To solve the problem, first of all, you have to understand it. Mm -hmm. And I always have the feeling that these people don't really understand the problem. So if you don't understand the problem, just forget about trying to solve it, of course. On the plus, is far away. Plus, there is a lot of politics. When they, they didn't uh, uplift elephant in Appendix 1, which is maximum protection, is mostly Appendix 1 all over Africa, but certain countries is Appendix 2, means, for example, that you can do trophy hunting and kill an elephant. You know, there is a lot behind the scenes and certain countries didn't want to take the responsibility to, uh, for example, to close the industry of trophy hunting in Zimbabwe or in Tanzania, for mm -hmm. example, so they prefer mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. not to take this decision. Okay. I'd obviously love to talk with you more, but we are already running 20 minutes behind. Sorry, uh, so my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not your fault. That's not what I was trying to say at all. But what I was... Uh, I'm switching back to German now. It's not a... Would you like to help Andrea Kroster's work? You can use your smartphone immediately to make a donation for the Elephant Action League. Here you can see the necessary information to do so. Please do support this crucial work. Thank you very much again for Andrea Kroster. A big hand. Thank you.